Welcome to tonight's Expert Angle webinar titled, Can We Really Use Viruses to Treat Prostate Cancer? My name is Julia Stevenson and I'm the Health Promotion Specialist at Prostate Cancer Canada. I will be moderating tonight's webinar. Please note that we are recording this webinar and it will be available for listening to on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in a couple of days. We'll start with a few housekeeping items. First, the Expert Angle team will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. Please keep questions related to tonight's webinar topic. Number two, questions will be answered during the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. And third, all attendees are automatically placed on mute to allow for the best quality audio. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO or you can email them at support at prostatecancer.ca. And now I would like to introduce you to tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Jean-Simon Diallo. Dr. Diallo obtained his master's degree in biochemistry at McGill University and his PhD in molecular biology at the Université de Montréal, where he studied natural compounds to treat prostate cancer and biomarkers to predict prostate cancer outcomes. During his postdoctoral fellowship, Dr. Diallo worked on using oncolytic viruses to treat cancer and discovered a host of viral sensitizer molecules that enhance viral infection. Since 2012, he has been a scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Working within a national network of collaborators, he and his team are working to improve virus-based therapeutics for the treatment of cancer and other diseases by combining them with an increasing collection of novel viral sensitizer small molecules. It is with great pleasure that I turn over this webinar to Dr. Diallo so we can all learn more about this topic. All right, well, thank you, Julia. So uh, um, there's a, a slide here. <clears throat> Uh, about the ground rules, just as a reminder, uh, I'll, I'll let you all read this and uh, won't take too much time on that since uh, Julia probably already covered this. So, <clears throat> so I'll start by uh, telling you a little bit about myself. I, I, there was already a, a, a fairly thorough introduction. I just thought I'd spend a little bit more time uh, <clears throat> telling you a little bit more about my scientific background. So I'm a, I'm a PhD. Uh, I train in a number of different universities, uh, first at, at the University of Ottawa, <clears throat> where I was studying uh, evolution of butterfly gut enzymes. Yes, it's a, it's a real area of study. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then I, I moved on to something uh, a little bit more uh, medically relevant, I guess, uh, which was uh, the regulation of hemoglobin genes. And at that time, uh, this was when, when gene therapy was sort of starting and, uh, and we were ho hoping to use um, different uh, viral vectors to, to treat uh, globin uh, deficiencies in humans. And uh, then I, I moved on to do a PhD on prostate cancer where we studied the uh, use of nutraceuticals, so compounds extracted from uh, natural uh, sources uh, to treat prostate cancer and also evaluated a number of, of different molecules for their, their use as biomarkers for, uh, for pr predicting uh, prostate cancer outcome. <clears throat> so I did that under the umbrella of uh, Dr. Fred Sad and, and Dr. Anne-Marie Mesmasson, uh, who were my mentors during that time. <clears throat> so then I moved on to Ottawa. Uh, I moved back to Ottawa and, and uh, was, uh, was so, sort of fell in love with, with oncolytic viruses uh, when I started my postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Dr. John Bell, who's, who's another one of my mentors and, and, and a great collaborator, um, and who was actually a, a very much a pioneer in this particular area of research, which I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, as we move forward. So uh, as Julia mentioned, I'm, I'm a scientist at the OHRI since 2012, um, and, uh, and we're working on a number of different areas uh, with a strong focus on oncolytic viral therapy, so viruses to treat cancer. So um, before I get into oncolytic viral therapy, I just want to do a little bit of background on cancer in general. Uh, I think uh, uh, everybody has probably seen uh, uh, at least a picture of somebody uh, that looks like this, that's been, got, been through chemotherapy. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, an all too common occurrence uh, as stated in the, in the statistics below. Um, and the reason why we observe uh, patients that lose their hair, uh, among others, uh, is because the, the types of therapy that have been uh, put forward for the treatment of cancer uh, are generally not very selective. They, they tend to target cells that grow at an accelerated pace. And that, of course, includes hair follicles, 
for other uh, organs as well, including uh, your intestinal lining and also your blood cells, because they actually regenerate quite quickly. So the hair loss is actually just a kind of a minute, although very impactful and uh, emblematic uh, side effect that, that is associated to chemotherapy and these sort of first generation cancer therapeutics. So there's a large unmet, unmet need in cancer therapy. Uh, and, and the main reason for that, although chemotherapy has uh, been effective and can be effective in some uh, malignancies, um, most of the time the current therapies that are available, uh, particular chemotherapy, is not curative. Um, uh, usually uh, recurrence occurs and uh, really what we were what we can do is just delay tumor progression, but eventually uh, the, the tumors come back, which is very unfortunate. Um, and it's particularly unfortunate when there are heavy side effects associated to chemotherapy. Um, again, as I mentioned, treatment resistance is something that occurs frequently. And uh, of course, as they target uh, rapidly dividing cells mostly, uh, which include, as I mentioned, blood cells and also immune cells, uh, our current approaches are not really designed to take advantage of a characteristic that, that is increasingly becoming important in managing cancer, particularly in the long term, which is uh, taking advantage of the capacity of the body's immune system to fight cancer. So you're most likely used to thinking of viruses uh, in the two scenarios above where you, you basically feel ill when you're infected by a virus such as influenza. I mean, looking at this picture in the top left, that was me last week. So we all know too well what, what getting infected with a virus uh, feels like. Um, hopefully fewer of you have been um, in, in the situation to the right where, where obviously some, some viruses can cause very significant disease. And it is, in, in fact, because of disease such as smallpox that people have figured out that, that you can actually use viruses as therapies. And one of the first examples of this is, of course, vaccines. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the vaccine for smallpox in particular has been a, a huge success uh, and a triumph for mankind in, in many ways. So um, today, uh, with the advent of, of genetic engineering, we've learned that we can use viruses to do many more things than just uh, prevent uh, infectious diseases. Um, among others, we can treat genetic illnesses with gene therapy, as I sort of uh, alluded to in my introduction. This is sort of something that I studied on when, when, when I was doing my master's. And today, <clears throat> we're basically uh, able to use viruses to treat cancer. And, and this is really what's going to be the focus of my, of my presentation today. So what's the rationale for using viruses to treat cancer? Well, before we can understand that, we need to go through the basic biology of cancer. So um, as you may, may well know, we're all composed of, of billions of healthy cells. And uh, as we age, uh, genetic mutations accumulate in, in our cells. Um, and there are a number of different factors that contribute to this, uh, and I won't go into that. But what's important is that at some point in time, these genetic mutations will lead to the cells uh, uh, growing incontrollably. Uh, and, and that's really the beginnings of cancer. Uh, when these cancer cells start to um, grow, are responding to the inhibitory signals that come from their neighbors. Um, and that's where sort of these pre-malignant lesions uh, start. But importantly, and I alluded, this, alluded to this earlier, the immune system is actually equipped to deal with these precancerous lesions. Uh, so if, if effectively, immune cells can actually kill these, these cells that, that have gone a little wonky. Um, but at some point, uh, through the accumulation of more genetic mutations and the development of genomic instability, the cancer cell starts to morph and, uh, and starts to evolve and adapt at a, an accelerated pace. Uh, and then it, it evolves the capacity to evade the immune system. And at that point in time, uh, there is, is definitely a uh, uh, it becomes more challenging because these tumors then develop into large masses. They start recruiting 
blood vessels, and then at some point in time, they will leave the primary site in a process called metastasis and go to secondary sites, at which point uh, this is where therapy becomes problematic because when the tumor is localized, uh, and prostate cancer is actually a very good example of that. When when the tumor is lock, localized to the prostate, it's actually quite quite uh, straightforward to remove it surgically. When the the tumor actually leaves the primary site, it becomes extremely difficult because first of all, we don't know where the cancer has gone, uh, and just a few cells can actually generate a tumor. Um, and usually, that's what what causes uh, the major problems, and where we have to resort to things like chemotherapy. Um, so. There, uh, at this point, the, 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 the junction at which the, the cancer cells start to evade the immune system uh, actually provides us uh, a, an opportunity to design viruses that re replicate specifically in cancer cells. And that's really the concept behind an oncolytic virus. The oncolytic virus is basically a virus that's been designed to take advantage of the accumulated defects in cancer cells. And they're designed in such a way that they replicate only in tumors but leave normal cells unharmed. That's the general principle behind a noncolytic virus. And you can really generate a noncolytic virus from any given virus. Obviously, there are some advantages to using some viruses over others. <clears throat> so essentially, the concept is quite simple. You take a, a, a wild-type virus and you remove genes from it. Uh, you make it more attenuated, either by genetic mutation or through selective pressure. And by doing this, we can have the viruses work for us to treat cancer. And, and just to give you some more clear examples of how this works. So again, cancers uh, exhibit several hallmarks that make them actually favorable breeding grounds to viral infections. And I mentioned already a few, one of which is, of course, the increase in cell proliferation that, that most cancers uh, experience. And that's associated to the production of more protein, the production of more nucleotides, which is actually the, the, the building block for DNA and, and, and other genetic molecules. Um, so those things viruses need as well. In order to produce themselves, they need to actually make protein and make nucleic, uh, nucleic acids. And so the viruses need very much the same things as cancer cells do, and they have genes that actually help them produce that and help hijack the cell in order to produce more of these things. So when we delete genes that are important for these things, we can now make the virus very dependent on the cancer cell in order to produce them such that the virus no longer replicates in normal cells, but can still replicate in a cancer cell. Very similarly, uh, I mentioned uh, that uh, at some point in time, the tumors start to evade the immune system. And, and by do, in the way that they do that, they actually throw the baby out uh, with the bathwater. So they actually get rid of their whole antiviral uh, response systems. And normal healthy cells have these systems such as to avoid being infected by viruses. That's our first line of defense. And so they throw this system out, and with it, they leave themselves extremely vulnerable to viral infection. Um, two other things that happen, of course, are, are that cancer cells are very resistant to death, uh, which I call utilitarian cell suicide, which is a, a process that normal cells use to uh, keep a balance uh, in the body of, so, so that your body doesn't keep growing and growing. So there's a, a, at any given time, there's a, a, a certain amount of cell death going on in your body. Um, and cancer cells stop doing this, and so they actually never die, which is why they, they, they also resist things like chemotherapy. <clears throat> and uh, another thing that happens is uh, they, they tend to uh, increase the expression of, of uh, of receptors that actually permit the, the viruses to enter. So it's possible to actually take advantage of each of those things and delete specific genes that are in the virus that actually take advantage of these. And, and really the key here is to make the virus dependent on the tumor for, for growth. Um, and that's how we can, we can use a number of different genetic tricks uh, to actually uh, achieve that. And you can actually uh, combine these things together to make the, the viruses even more selective. So one example of this that we use frequently in our lab uh, is vesicular stomatitis virus. This is a, 
a small virus uh, of the rhabdovirus family. It's a distant cousin of rabies. Uh, its primary hosts are actually insects. It's not a human disease. Um, and uh, importantly, this virus replicates in the part of the cell that doesn't in contain uh, the genetic information. Uh, and it, it is a, a virus that's based on RNA, not DNA, which means it can't recombine or integrate in the human genome. Uh, and that's actually a very good safety feature. And uh, the virus is small, but we can still clone in genes. Uh, for example, fluorescence proteins for tracking, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, and importantly, it's, it's also very good at stimulating the immune system. Um, and, and in the particular case of, of oncolytic viral therapy, the strains that we use exploit cancer defects in the antiviral response. And so we've removed uh, or inactivated genes that are normally uh, used by VSV to, uh, uh, to dampen the, uh, the antiviral response of normal cells. So again, this virus is dependent on the fact that cancers have this defect. So here's just an example, still at the preclinical level. <clears throat> uh, this is an experiment that was done uh, over, over a decade ago by uh, Dr. Steudel and, 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 and Dr. Bell. Um, and really, this is a, a what's called a lung metastasis model, where we basically use mice and we inject uh, cancer cells in their tail vein. And the cells basically uh, go throughout the body and implant in the lung. And if you let them go uh, for a couple of weeks, uh, you can clearly see that tumors form quite readily. So this is a normal uh, mouse lung, and this is a, a, the same mouse lung, but two weeks later, which is riddled with tumors. You do see a little bit of this normal tissue here in pink. And what I want you to uh, appreciate is that this particular virus expresses a, a fluorescent protein, a green fluorescent protein. So that means that when we shine a UV light on it, uh, wherever it's replicating is turning green. And so that's what you're actually observing here. And, and remarkably, you can clearly see, well, first that the virus is replicating very, very effectively in these tumors, uh, but is leaving this normal tissue area uh, unscathed. And so this is highlighting both the cell activity and the robustness of, and the potential robustness of oncolytic viral therapy in this particular model. <clears throat> when you uh, follow these mice, um, and for those who are not familiar with these types of graphs, this is called the Kaplan-Meier curve. Um, and, and really, the, the concept behind this type of graph is quite simple. You basically have two groups here, one that's been treated with this uh, vesicular stomatitis virus and one that has not. And uh, they've all been given these, uh, these tumors uh, implanted in the lungs. And you're basically following the survival of the group over time. Uh, and each step in the graph is, some, is a mouse that has died in one of these groups. And so what you can clearly see is that <clears throat> when you don't give VSV, the mice slowly uh, die from their cancers. But when you treat them with VSV, all the mice survive. You've basically turned these lungs into these normal lungs again, and we've basically cured these animals. And what's really remarkable, is, at least in this model, uh, when you actually re-inject the, the tumors in animals that have been cured, they actually reject any subsequent tumor uh, of the same type. So this suggests that the viruses uh, work not only by killing the cancer cells, but also uh, generate a memory response, an anti-tumor uh, an anti immune response uh, that is long-lasting. <clears throat> so this is something that was observed in mice over a decade ago but now is being seen in humans. So this was a clinical trial that was done with another oncolytic virus uh, that's actually derived from the vaccine for smallpox. And this was a patient that had a liver, uh, a liver cancer that metastasized to the neck. And the virus was injected in this metastasis that's basically the size of a baseball. And over a period of a month, the tumor completely went away. Uh, and eventually, this patient uh, passed away of natural causes not related to either virus or cancer. So those were early clinical hopes for oncolytic viruses. And, and I can tell you that today, very recently, the first oncolytic virus was approved 
for treatment of melanoma in the United States. Um, and so this is this dates from April 29th, almost a year ago now. But I can tell you that this has been approved, uh, basically a, a little bit over two months ago. And so this has been obviously very exciting for the entire field of oncolytic viral therapy because reality is something that we can actually use uh, in people. <clears throat> So just to, to get back to this, uh, oncolytic viruses work by multiple mechanisms. So the first thing that, that we think is important is uh, the direct oncolysis of the tumor cells by the virus. So the virus infects the cell, uh, it grows and multiplies within the cancer cell, and then bursts the cell and then goes to infect another cancer cell. Um, and so uh, every time a cell bursts, basically the cell is, is killed because obviously the, uh, the, the, the cell uh, can't uh, handle having so much virus inside it. The second thing, as I mentioned already, is that uh, there's generation of an anti-cancer immune response. Uh, and so that uh, not only affects the, the, the tumor that's infected, but potentially also metastases uh, that are uninfected as well because the immune system goes and seeks them out. Uh, other things that I didn't mention uh, include cutting off of the tumor blood supply. Uh, when these tumors get infected, the, the blood supply gets cut off, and uh, that also contributes to uh, anti-cancer effects. And the last thing that I'll mention is that uh, somewhat similarly to gene therapy, we can actually put uh, different therapeutic transgenes inside these viruses to increase the effect, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So. I just showed you some pretty tremendous and powerful examples of what oncolytic viruses can do, but I'd be lying to you if I said that they worked like that all the time. The reality is that much like for other treatments, there's tremendous heterogeneity in the response. And this is a complicated slide, but I'll, I'll sum this up in, in a very uh, succinct fashion. At the Ottawa Hospital, we have the capacity to obtain uh, patient specimens directly after surgery, so tumors that are resected from patients, and then we can obtain them from our colleague surgeons and then uh, cut them up into little pieces and, and, and put them in tissue culture or in, in petri dishes. And then we can infect them to see how uh, sensitive they are to the virus. And we did this in collaboration with Dr. Hisham Abdelbari, who is an orthopedic surgeon. So here we're looking at about 30 patients that had uh, sarcoma, which is a form of uh, cancer. And we then measured, uh, we infected all these tissues with, uh, with virus, and we measured how much virus uh, came out, which is a measure, of course, of how sensitive they are to the virus. And, and what I want you to appreciate here is, is the x-axis here, which is actually in a log scale. So each increment means, is 10 times more than the previous. So this is, let's say, 10, 100, 1,000, et cetera, et cetera, up to about a million. So you can appreciate that these patients here, these tumors here, were not very infectable at all with this virus compared to these patients, which had about a million times more virus come out of their tumors which really means that they were highly sensitive. So really, this heterogeneity is, is a cause for concern and, 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 and certainly a challenge and a hurdle to get consistently uh, good efficacy using oncolytic viruses. And just to highlight this point a little bit more, this is actually an experimental model uh, that, that I think illustrates this quite nicely. So we have uh, again, this is a mouse model of cancer. This, in this case, is a colon cancer that's, that's uh, of mouse origin. And we have two versions of the same cancer, uh, basically two cells that, were, that came from the same cancer. One was this very sensitive to viral infection, and the other one was very resistant to viral infection. And you can see that here, this, this, these cells are infected with a virus, and you can see uh, that expresses a green fluorescent protein, so uh, clearly here they're very infected. Same thing here when we, we use uh, uh, tumor cores like I showed you before. This, this resistant population, however, it only sees minor infection uh, compared to the, the sensitive clone. And, and what we, we can actually see is that if we make tumors that are mixtures of these different populations, so the resistant and the sensitive, well, we get vastly different 
effects. <clears throat> so when the sensitive population is in, if the tumor is com entirely composed of the sensitive population, well, we see a Kaplan-Meier curve that's very similar to what I showed you before. We can cure all these mice. But as soon as there's about 10% of a resistant population in there, well, the, the efficacy is dramatically reduced. And so dealing with this heterogeneity is, is certainly something that, that is relevant and important. So how do we deal with this? Well, there are a number of strategies, and I'm, I'm not <clears throat> putting them all here, but I, I want to focus on three that we think are important. <clears throat> so one of them is to select more effective viral strains, strains that are just more effective right from the start. The second approach is to leverage the immune response. Uh, and we can use a trick borrowed from vaccines to do that, and I'll explain that a little bit later. The third is that you can actually use drugs to sensitize tumors to viral infection. And that's something that I specialize on and which I'll discuss a little bit more. So the first one, selecting better viral strains. So here's an example of, of, of how we can do this. So uh, I showed you data with VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus, which is, again, a rhabdovirus. And uh, what was done by uh, Dr. Stoinel's group was, was something called bioprospecting. So uh, biologists like to go around the world and collect different uh, strains of viruses and bugs. And, uh, they usually keep libraries of these things, and <clears throat> so fortunately someone uh, had the bright idea of, of making a library of rhabdoviruses, which uh, Dr. Stortle, uh borrowed and tested uh, on a number of different cancer cells. <clears throat> and in doing this, he found that there was vast differences in the capacity of these different strains of rhabdoviruses to infect a variety of different breasts colon, melanoma, lung, et cetera, cancer lines. And what he found is that there was this particular strain called Maraba uh, that was extremely effective basically across the board, had 100% efficacy in all cancers, including prostate cancer. So this Maraba virus is actually, a, again, a rhabdovirus that's isolated from sand flies in the jungles of Brazil, again, related to VSV uh, genetically. But uh, uh, the, one of the important differences is that um, there's basically no uh, seropositivity in the population. Um, and that's important because when we infect with the virus, if you're already immune to it, that's not very good for the virus. <clears throat> so, um, so that was a, a very good feature. Um, and again, uh, genetically, it's very, very close to vesicular stomatitis virus, which we knew was very selective, effective, and safe. <clears throat> so Maraba is a, a very good candidate. Uh, and some, it's a platform from which we can work and improve upon. And one of the ways we can improve upon it is by leveraging the immune system. So I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, that cancer cells over time learn to evade the immune system because the immune system, and in particular uh, cells called T cells, uh, recognize uh, proteins on tumors that are uh, associated to the cancer, uh, the, 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 the cancer characteristics. So the, the T cells will actually latch on to these cancer cells and try to kill them. Um, what happens over time is, of course, that the T cells become very ineffective at doing this because the tumors evolved ways to get around that. Um, and really, the trick here is to actually re-stimulate these cells to attack the tumor, using the virus as a way to stimulate them to do that. So the way that's been devised by uh, my colleague, Dr. Brian Lichty and Dr. Yong Hong Wan at McMaster University is to use a, an old trick from vaccines, which is basically uh, called a heterologous prime boost. And really all it is is, is basically boosting uh, a vaccine against a cancer uh, protein. Um, so I'll try to, to explain this because it's a little bit complicated, but it's important to understand because I think it's a powerful technique. So really, I, I mentioned before that uh, cancers actually uh, express proteins that, that are sort of unique to cancers, and those are called cancer antigens. And for example, uh, in melanoma, one of those antigens is called DCT. It's actually a protein 
that's uh, involved in uh, the formation of pigments. That's why melanomas are often black. And so DCT is what's called a, a cancer antigen. So you can vaccinate animals against this antigen. Um, that will create some kind of immune response against the cancer, but that's not a very effective response. Um, you can see here, if you look at the activation of the T cells that I just mentioned, uh, the vaccine for DCT is modestly effective at acti activating T cells. So the, the higher up, the more activated. Um, again, if you look uh, at the therapeutic efficacy, uh, you see that this vaccine does have some impact on tumor growth, and, and, and progression, but not terribly uh, much. So the trick here is to, after you vaccinated against this cancer antigen, you then boost uh, this uh, vaccination using an oncolytic virus, again, a virus that will replicate specifically in the tumor, but that expresses this same cancer antigen. Um, and, and really, you've all been to the doctors before and had your vaccines or you go in for one shot and then they ask you to come back a little bit later to get a booster. Well, this is the same concept, it's just you're using two different vaccines. The common ground between those two vaccines is the cancer antigen. And that combination is extremely effective. So you can see here how activated the T cells are against that cancer antigen and the correlating impact on tumor progression. And, and this is so powerful that now this melanoma metastasis model is, is cured. So these are now long-term responses. So I think that's a, a very powerful approach and a, and a way to improve the efficacy in, in the face of heterogeneity. Um, and just to point out that this approach is, uh, has been sort of validated in in uh, non-human primates, so monkeys, uh, had a very excellent safety profile, and now there's a clinical trial underway at four sites across Canada looking at this, uh, this uh, approach uh, using MAGE A3, which is a, another cancer antigen that's expressed on a number of different solid tumors. Um, and so far, things are going very well. So the third approach is to use drugs to sensitize uh, tumors to virus. And uh, again, if you, if you remember the graph that I showed you with the different tumor specimens and their different sensitivities to viral infection, well, this is kind of highlighted here. Uh, not all the tumors are created alike, and they don't have as far to go in terms of, uh, of, of sensitivity to viral infection. So our idea was that we might be able to actually use drugs to sort of sensitize tumors that were resistant, uh, that were otherwise resistant to viral infection. And so, long story short, this is something that I did during my postdoc. Um, basically, I screened thousands and thousands and thousands of drugs. I, I used a robot to do this. It took a good part of two years of my life to actually go through all these drugs and to design this experiment. And at the end, it was a worthwhile effort because we identified over a dozen compounds we now call as a group viral sensitizers that really sensitize resistant cancer cells to infection with oncolytic viruses such as BSV <clears throat> and Maraba. So here what you're looking at is, again, a virus that expresses a fluorescent protein. In this case, it's a red protein. And in control conditions, what you're looking at are a few foci of infection because this cancer cell line is resistant to the virus. <clears throat> but when you treat with viral sensitizers, you can clearly see, uh, plain as day, that the virus is now spreading uh, quite well within these uh, resistant cancer cells. So the cancer cells are no longer resistant to the virus, and therefore we can uh, regain therapeutic efficacy. And so one thing that, that I want to highlight is that many of the compounds that we identified are actually mar microtubule targeting agents, um, and, and that will become uh, important in, in a few slides. Um, and, and this is just to show that we used a different number of models in, in mice, uh, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, and, and at least four different ones, showing that these microtubule targeting agents can really uh, improve the efficacy of an oncolytic virus in models basically where neither virus or the drugs that are often, uh, among others, used for chemotherapy. Uh, so the, they're on their own not effective, but in uh, in combination with the virus, uh, you start to see delayed tumor progression. <clears throat> so what about prostate cancer? Um, 
Well, you probably know that prostate cancer develops from uh, your prostate gland, uh, which is situated just below your bladder. Um, and of course, uh, when you present with prostate cancer, you may uh, present at different stages. And at the early stages of the disease, uh, really treatment by surgery is quite effective. But at the later stages, uh, where the disease starts to spread and, uh, and disseminate towards, for example, the lymph nodes and elsewhere, uh, this becomes much more difficult to treat. And this is sort of the normal progression, well, not normal, but this is sort of the worst case scenario of post prostate cancer progression. Uh, usually uh, patients present themselves after a rise in, in PSA, prostatic specific antigen, and then they undergo either surgery or radiotherapy, and then they have a, a drop in, in PSA. And if there's cancer that remains, there will be a rise in PSA progressively, and at some point in time, uh, the, the, uh, the doctors will often prescribe what's called hormone therapy, which really is, in a nutshell, uh, using the fact that prostate cells require testosterone and androgens in order to survive. So if you remove those androgens or testosterone, they start to die, and that's really what hormone therapy is all about. The only problem is that, much like uh, I mentioned before, because these cancers start to have genomic instability, some of these tumor cells will have, you know, morphed in a way that they are now independent of androgens. And that's where we develop now a condition called uh, resistant uh, androgen independent or castrate resistant prostate cancer, castration resistant prostate cancer. And at that point, really the only option today is chemotherapy. And, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the chemotherapy that is used are basically microtubule targeting agents. <clears throat> so we, uh, we think there's some opportunities for viral therapy in prostate cancer. So uh, the concept of using a vaccine for prostate cancer is not a new one because, in fact, one of the first vaccines, uh, cancer vaccines, was approved for prostate cancer. It's called Provenge. Uh, now, uh, I should say it's the most expensive therapy available, <laughs> one of the most expensive therapeutics available. I think it's uh, about $200,000 for treatment. Um, and it hasn't been particularly successful. In fact, the, the company that, uh, that, that put this forward has actually gone belly up. But it, it, it has shown proof of concept that you can use a vaccine in the context of prostate cancer, and I think that's important. Um, the other thing that's important is that prostate cancer uh, is, has a number of different antigens that we can target. So things that are specific to the prostate cancer uh, that will allow us to generate a very strong immune response against, uh, against the cancer. And the third, uh, which I alluded to already, uh, is that microtubule targeting agents that we know enhance viral growth and viral efficacy are actually standard for management of uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So here's just kind of an example uh, I wanted to leave you on. This is a, uh, a prostate cancer specimen that was obtained by a colleague of mine, Rodney Bro, at uh, the Ottawa Hospital. And uh, we, we can see that this uh, tumor was infected with the Maraba virus expressing green fluorescent protein. And this particular patient is somewhat refractory to the virus on its own. But again, uh, adding docetaxel, which is a uh, mainstay therapy for advanced uh, androgen-independent prostate cancer, we can see more infection. Um, so, so again, we, we feel like uh, prostate cancer is a, a potentially a very interesting target for uh, prostate cancer for, for these number of reasons. So I'll just uh, stop here and summarize. Um, uh, first, I, I'd like to just remind you that tumors evolve to escape the immune system, and this is really an opportunity to design oncolytic viruses to treat cancer uh, and, and, in fact, use immunotherapy in general to reactivate that immune system to attack the cancer. Uh, oncolytic viruses are now a clinical reality. They're used in humans, and I think it's now time that, to you know, go beyond melanoma and, and start attacking different solid malignancies like prostate cancer. Uh, oncolytic viruses, again, work by multiple, multiple mechanisms, and I think that's, that's largely why they can be so effective. <clears throat> but again, there, there are some hurdles, and we can still improve them uh, by using more effective strains like Maraba virus, 
uh, leveraging the immune system using the oncolytic vaccine approach and combining with drugs uh, as for example with docetaxel <clears throat> and for all those reasons I think prostate cancer is a logical target for this form of therapy uh, and uh, I'm not the only one that thinks this uh, fortunately we've been uh, blessed uh, by uh, receiving a, a Movember team grant and we uh, thank the prostate cancer uh, Prostate Cancer Canada for this um, and uh, this is a grant that uh, involves multiple investigators uh, across uh, uh, Ottawa, Hamilton, Montreal and also Toronto um, and the goal is simple. We want to develop an oncolytic vaccine for prostate cancer and evaluate it in patients um, and so this project is led uh, by uh, my mentor and colleague uh, Dr. John Bell uh, working with me in Ottawa, as well as uh, Dr. Brian Lichty in Hamilton, and Sebastian Hott, who's a clinician at McMaster, and also my previous mentor, Fred Saad, uh, who, who guided me through my PhD, who's in Montreal, who has be become very interested in uh, this particular project and, and moving it to the clinic. Um, so essentially, that's all I have for you today, and uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'll do my best to answer. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Diallo. Before we take any questions, and just a reminder to please use the questions box to do this, we would like to do a quick poll to see how many people were participating in today's webinar. I'll just give everyone a few seconds to do this. Thank you, everyone. Our first question is about a drug called Rigbur um, that was originally developed in Latvia and, uh, for melanoma cancer um, and was reported that there might be use for other cancers such as prostate. And wondering if you know of this and if there's any data that you're aware of about this drug. <clears throat> well, I, I have, it's not the first time I hear of this drug. Uh, unfortunately, the data of it is not particularly well available, so it's hard for me to, uh, to actually say whether it's, it's, it's going to be effective or not. All I can say is that in principle, using the, not just one virus that, that can achieve uh, these effects, and so it's quite possible that many other viruses can be designed to do to do what, what we're aiming to do. Uh, but of course, you have to look at the data, and that data needs to be available to judge whether it's going to be effective or not. And, and I, I've not really seen the, the data for Rigbeer. Great, thank you. Um, is the virus treatment an option for people who have had a prostate surgery? Uh, I, I think so. Uh, in, in fact, uh, many of us believe that the oncolytic vaccine uh, might be most uh, most beneficial, particularly at that stage. So um, once you've had your prostate removed or your cancer removed, the hope is that you don't have any cancer left over. But there's never a guarantee of that uh, because, of course, these cancer cells are microscopic and we don't yet have the detection methods to actually go in and, and find uh, uh, any tumors below, uh, for example, one millimeter. Um, and so it's very difficult to know whether you have cancer is still remaining in you after uh, surgery. And so at that moment in time, you have very little tumor, and if you use an oncolytic vaccine approach, you may be actually able to generate an immune response against that little amount of tumor that's left. Uh, and so we think that that might be a, actually a really great place to intervene. Great, thank you. We have a number of questions about um, how people can access viral therapy in Canada. So could you give us a little bit of an overview of the scene of um, is this treatment being used for prostate cancer patients? If so, where in the country? <clears throat> right, so, so that in, at this point, because these, so these uh, particularly the oncolytic vaccine approach is still at the experimental phase, uh, we're still doing phase one clinical trials, which are basically looking at safety in all comers. So really the only way to get on that trial is to uh, basically contact uh, your physician uh, or your oncologist and, and let them know that you're interested in this trial and, and they would have to themselves forward to our clinical uh, trials office uh, in order to uh, see if they're available. But 
unfortunately, I have to say that these things are on uh, patients on are on waiting lists, and that waiting list is already full for our trial. Uh, now, again, there are other oncolytic viruses that are being evaluated all over the place, and, and my uh, general advice is to always uh, look on clinicaltrials.gov because there's a lot of different trials that might be available uh, other than the oncolytic viruses that, that we're working with today. And, and again, the first approved oncolytic viruses is only for the treatment of melanoma. Uh, I'm not sure if they have a prostate cancer trial, but that's something that you can find out about in clinicaltrials.gov. Great, thank you. Our next question is, is the same virus used for all different types of cancers, or would different viruses be used for different types of cancers? So there's, there's the opportunity to use different types of viruses for different types of cancers. Um, now, obviously, we tend to prefer a silver bullet type approach, and in fact, uh, viruses like Moraba, technically speaking, can really attack any given uh, tumor, except uh, there may be some sites where you might want to prefer one virus over another. So, for example, uh, viruses that will uh, trigger uh, inflammation in the brain probably wouldn't be very good for, for uh, brain cancer. Um, uh, and, and in other ways, some viruses can't infect certain types of cells. So, for example, the smallpox vaccine, and I, sh I showed an example of that particular virus, uh, actually doesn't ex infect blood cells, so you can't use those for bloodborne uh, cancers. Um, so there is some cell activity, but in principle, uh, you can use one virus for multiple different types of cancers. Great, thank you. Can you let us know a little bit about what the side effects would be um, for someone going through a, a using this treatment for cancer? So really, that's kind of the beauty of this approach, and I really should have mentioned that earlier, uh, so I really thank uh, whoever asked this question. Um, really, that's one of the main differences between chemotherapy and oncolytic viral therapy. For oncolytic viruses, what you experience are basically flu-like symptoms for a period of 24 hours. This is a far cry from the hair loss and all the sequelae that you get from chemotherapy. Great, thank you. And for um Hypothetically, for a patient that's gone through chemotherapy and radiation and they have immunosuppression um, with their prostate cancer, what would be the effect of OV on those kinds of, on patients that have already gone through a chemo or radiation therapy for, for prostate cancer? Well, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, and, and of course, the, the, the early clinical trials are usually uh, done in patients that are not immunosuppressed as much as possible. Uh, but our data suggests that, in fact, the viruses can be inf more effective in some cases because they can actually infect the, the tumors better. So, for example, in the in the combination with a microtubule destabilizer, which uh, uh, or a market microtubule targeting agent, we'd expect to see better efficacy. Uh, so, uh, I think initially, you know, the initial safety data is obtained in patients that are not immunosuppressed but uh, I think there is the potential to treat even an immunosuppressed patient because of the inherent selectivity of the virus towards the cancer. Thank you. And so in a follow-up to that question for a prostate cancer patient that's gone through um, androgen deprivation therapy and might have muscle loss, is there an OV therapy that can um, be used to reverse that muscle wasting in addition to tumor regression? Well, that's a good question. I don't think anybody's ever looked at that, to be completely honest with you. So um, it's an interesting possibility, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of that. Thank you. And there's a couple questions here about virus and influenza virus being used as um, potentially viruses in the treatment against cancer. Is there anything you, um, anything you could speak to about that? <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, again, I, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, it's definitely possible to use any virus for, uh, for uh, as an oncolytic virus, but some viruses have advantages over others. So, uh, you know, one of the issues that we do come across, and, and this kind of links to the immunosuppression question, is that if you have an existing immunity against the virus, it's much harder for us to deliver the virus and for the virus to be effective because the immune system are already uh, is is uh, uh, has the immunity to to get rid of the virus, and so that can become a problem. So in the case of measles, 
uh, you can overcome that problem by just giving really, really, really high doses. Uh, but then that comes with the caveat that, that from, from uh, something mundane like manufacturing, uh, it becomes a real problem because you need to, manuf you need to make so much virus uh, in order uh, to be effective that it becomes a little bit prohibitive. But it's definitely possible to use measles in patients that have uh, very little response against that against the virus because most of the population has already been uh, vaccinated with measles, and and the same is true for many strains of influenza. Great, thank you. The next question is about: Is OV therapy effective against any type of prostate cancer, or because of the mutations with prostate cancer and the different types, is it more is uh, using a virus more effective with certain types of prostate cancer than others? Well, you know, that's that question is still wide open, and we're hoping that with the with the the team grant that we've obtained, we can we can start to get uh, get answers to those questions because really that's not been uh, thoroughly explored yet in the context of prostate cancer. Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have is, how long do you think it will be before prostate cancer might be treated in this way? <clears throat> well, uh, so I'll give you some timelines that, that we're thinking about uh, because obviously we're, we're actively pushing towards this. There may be other teams that are working on this in parallel. But as for our group, we're aiming to have a clinical trial underway within the next five years. Um, and, and of course, if we're successful, we expect that you know, it will be probably another uh, at least three to five years after that before that's actually available. Uh, that being said, there may be other teams that are out there working on prostate cancer using other viruses and other approaches, and they may be uh, available er earlier. Um, and but really, uh, based on that, I would I would estimate that within the next five to ten years, we should start seeing some of these things appear for prostate cancer. Thank you. And for patients who want to follow your research and your progress, um, what's the best way for them to do that to to keep track of what's happening? Well, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> well, <laughs> you can always Google my name. That usually uh, shows uh, what what my me and my team are up to. Uh, obviously, a very good way to access the scientific literature, even to get a sort of summary of what what types of of studies we've been publishing. Uh, I always recommend uh, PubMed, which is a uh, a site that, that basically has all the uh, scientific publications. That might be a little bit less accessible for people who are not experts, uh, but that, that gives you a good idea of, of the, the types of things that we're working on. Thank you. And can you reiterate for folks um, where the best place is for them to follow upcoming clinical trials, clinical trials that might be in the works now or maybe down the line to check if there's new clinical trials in this area near them. What's the best place for them to find that information? <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, I, I can only give the advice that I, I follow myself, which is, is really going on clinicaltrials.gov, which is a, a site hosted by, by the, uh, the NIH. Uh, it's, a, it's a U.S. site, but it really shows all the, uh, all the clinical trials available internationally. So you can really quickly see um, what trials are, avail are available. It's a searchable trial. So for example, you can type prostate cancer, androgen independence, and immunotherapy, and you'll see all the trials that, that, that have those keywords, and you can quickly sort through them to see what's available in Canada, uh, which is what I would initially recommend to st where I recommend to start, but then also see what's available internationally. Thank you so much. And then if folks were to have questions following up what they've seen online, they can either then contact uh, the person running the clinical trial, the coordinator, or talk with their doctor. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's always the best approach. I mean, uh, often people contact the scientists, and that's really not the best way because we actually have very little, con well, we have no control over who gets on clinical trials. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Dale. That was all the questions we've had today, and we really appreciate you answering them all. And thank you for pro providing information on such an important topic, one that's really of interest to our audience. Thank you, too, to our participants for your questions and comments and for being on the call in the webinar tonight. I also wanted to gratefully acknowledge the support of our sponsors, Abby, Estellas, and Jansen, who make this webinar series possible. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, April 19th at 7 p.m., 
with Dr. Linda Carlson on the topic of mindfulness in cancer. As always, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Prostate Cancer Canada website in the coming days. If you are looking for further information on prostate cancer, please connect with our helpline at 1-855-PCC-INFO or you can email them at support at prostatecancer.ca. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your evening.